Hi there, I'm a Dr Angus Wan and I work at the Kennedy Institute for Rheumatology at the University of Oxford, where I'm a principal investigator, so I head up a medical research laboratory. So on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, running a research lab is a little bit like running a small business, I suppose. And that's really because I work with a kind of unique research environment that enables us to focus entirely on our research. So whilst I'm in a university environment, which means there are students around, undergraduate students, master's students and PhD students, and they're a large part of what we do in the lab, I spend quite a, uh, only a really small amount of my time doing formal teaching. The majority of my time is thinking about the research questions we have, organizing the laboratory the way we need it to run, making sure we've got the equipment and the resources we need to sort of address the scientific questions we want to. And then a fair amount of meetings, I guess, with the PhD students, with the postdoctoral researchers, with the technicians to think about the questions we're approaching, the experiments we're doing on a day to day basis and to make sure we're happy with the progress we're making. And then, of course, I guess the other side of my job is to think about the outputs of that. So to think about the, the papers that we'll write, the publications, the manuscripts, the reviews we might write, the talks we might give to sort of disseminate some of the ideas and the results of the experiments that we're doing on a day to day basis. And then the other part really is probably the, the small business part where, of course, I'm spending time trying to put together proposals predominantly to charities and uh, UKRI, so UK research and innovation derived sort of bodies to think about supporting our work financially. So to give us money to really salary the people that work for me, to support the consumables, the reagents and the things that people use, the equipment costs and all the runnings of the lab so that we can do the experiments that we want to do. Because some of our team are students, I spend quite a bit of time too, probably mentoring them, thinking about their research and thinking a little bit about their careers and what they want to do next. I guess if I have to describe myself thinking about skills, well, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist and really a scientist's sort of core skills are their kind of ability to question things, to skeptically critique things. Obviously to read the literature, so to understand the kind of current state of affairs with knowledge and to sort of contextualize the questions that we want to ask within that. And that brings in a, a slightly more English language side of things, I suppose. You need to understand where people are coming at uh, with their research outputs, with their papers, and of course to make sure that we disseminate our research in many different forms. So we might have to write something that's for the scientific community, but something that also works for the lay public so that the public understand the research we're doing and to communicate that in lots of different ways. And that goes beyond the written word, but also oral communication. So actually probably what people underestimate is communication skills in science and probably the ability to convey ideas to other people to elicit excitement in other people about the science you're doing to make sure and convey that what you're doing is interesting, important and, and making good progress. So we've got the sort of scientific skills, I guess, the ability to question something, the ability to design an experiment and to think about whether our interpretations are right. In behind that scientific um, approach is obviously a, a good bedrock of understanding of the biological mechanisms, um, understanding sometimes the ways and the means by which we use physics and mathematics to quantify things and to understand and analyze the data that we're seeing. And within that communication spectrum, some soft skills really. So again, not to underestimate the ability to sort of empathize and communicate with the members of your team, because ultimately the, the sort of um, data that we produce is produced as part of a team so good ability to work within a team and often to work within a team that may well be made up of people from lots of different countries and lots of different sort of scientific backgrounds and so you might have to integrate your kind of ideas with an engineer with a physicist with a medic quite often with the clinical side of things so again ability to communicate so I think we're at an exciting time in, in science that probably means that when I think about what I would have studied along the way towards where I've arrived, it might look quite different now. I, at school, I certainly studied and enjoyed biology the most, but I, I studied chemistry, physics, and I really enjoyed geography actually at school. 
I, I probably looking back wish that my mathematics was stronger. Um, we live in an age certainly now where there is a lot of big data. So to think about quantitative data and large numerical data sets. I went to university to study physiology. And actually, I, I think that's probably an example of a good undergraduate course maybe to look into because it's broad based. And I think what people should probably do then is to think about broad based um, studies, things that will give them a real spectrum of understanding within the subject area that they're interested in, and then look into what maybe some of the research strengths might be, or some of the particular strengths in any department at university might be, so that they could maybe pick up some interesting specialisms within that broad spectrum. So if you're fascinated by genetics particularly, you know, think about doing a broad biomedical undergraduate degree or something but one that's likely to have some specialist modules in genetics because it has some researchers there who are particularly interested in genetics. So I did a BSc. Um, there are then plenty of options after that. So some people like to think about doing a master's. They might specialise a little bit more after that. And I think that's a, that's a difficult decision because I think a master's may well be worthwhile if the environment and the course is really absolutely appropriate to what you want to do next and you kind of know that that's what you need to do because we definitely hire a lot of researchers who've spent a little bit more time in the scientific environment doing something like a master's and that's helped them a great deal but I would probably really think hard about that decision about whether that money and extra time at university is best spent on a master's because if you're really sure you want to get into research then what I did next was go straight to doing a PhD and I think ultimately that gives you a real period of time three possibly four maybe even five years to sort of learn how to think to learn how to philosophize about questions and to obviously get your hands really properly involved and get really into doing something practically and that definitely was what I had to do I mean I certainly had to do a PhD inevitably to then move forward as a, as a researcher after that. We're regularly looking for people who love biology but have excellent mathematics skills and probably can code and write script as well so that we can think about how to you know turn things like even AI and stuff to our um, advantage. So. Broad skills are very, very useful. So I work within a, in a, in a big sort of research centre within our institute, and that means we've got people doing quite a number of different roles. So if I start maybe with the PhD students that are laboratory-based, or even if they're dry lab, maybe computational-based, largely they may well be a little bit at the beck and call of the experiments they're doing. So what I mean by that is that they're probably going to design experiments and they're going to have to be in the lab whenever those experiments need them to be in the lab. So they may well be doing some time courses that run over the weekend or run late into the night. And that means that probably their adaptability and flexibility and ability to kind of organize their own time is pretty useful because they may well have to accept. And certainly during my PhD phase, I worked a lot of weekends and a lot of late nights. But I think science certainly when you learn to do it well you know um breeds trust to a certain extent and so there's given this take you know if you're in potentially running an experiment late on a saturday night i, I think if you work in a nice environment and you're, you're a hard working person you know then you've got flexibility quite often within that and a great deal of autonomy i would say so probably academic research certainly into a, maybe to a lesser extent industry will give you quite a lot of control over how you operate because ultimately it's getting it's getting the kind of final data and results that matters so how and when you do that's less important postdoctoral researchers a little bit more senior than students probably learn to organize their time even better so they may well um, have a, a work pattern or experimental pattern that works for themselves it is still probably very rarely a sort of standard nine five. They may well be coming in a bit later because their experiment runs later or fitting in around each other because they share equipment. You've then got a lot of um, technical and support staff, people that may be related more to the equipments, to the running of the lab. They're probably a little bit more core hours. So we'd probably like to, as much as we can, have technical support staff working a little bit more like a an 8.4 or 9.5, something within that region where most people are around, they can be around to support that. And obviously that's similar for the clinically associated staff like 
nurses and things, although they may well be collecting sample and working with the wards. And of course, the wards have their own timings. So the clinical side of things is quite different. For myself, I think probably I have the maximum autonomy and that's, that's sort of amazing, but obviously I have a team that could be working at any one time. So I'm probably slightly on call all the time um, and trying to sort of organize myself and my guys to be as productive and happy as they can be. There probably are quite a lot of hours. Research really needs and just takes what you can afford to give it. So I think if you're looking for more information on, on science, then you're in luck because nowadays there are certainly a great number of places to go and look for these sorts of things. Um, I think there are examples even on the radio, like programs like Life Scientific, that sometimes describe people at the far end of their careers. You've had very successful careers in lots of different scientific disciplines. Kind of looking back over that and, and discussing the pros, the cons, the things they like out of their job, that sort of thing. That's pretty global. Definitely the major publishing houses, so things like Nature and some of the societies that are associated with science, like the Royal Society, for example, have a lot of materials on their websites. Nature almost certainly have a podcast. They almost certainly have a whole load of social media things, not least Twitter, that will be full of lots of information about what science they think is cool at the moment, that's hot, what people are doing. Twitter's actually becoming a a really powerful tool for scientists. I think for science, it's all about impact, about disseminating that information. And so probably to a certain extent, if you're interested in sort of research group that you might literally find through a university read uh, webpage or maybe through some of their work that's been published in a major journal. And some of those research groups websites will have lots of information. They may well run podcasts. They may well have their own sort of social media outlets that tell you a little bit more about what they do on a day to day basis. Uh, you will start to find many scientists talking at careers events, talking at STEM events, obviously. Uh, you will find them in museums. You will often find them in places um, delivering, even in, in, in places like pubs. Sometimes you'll find someone doing sort of a pint of science or something like that, where they may have a uh, even maybe a stand-up show that's devoted to talking about their life, their career, what they really, really do. And I think sometimes they're particularly insightful because you'll get somebody really talking about the human side of their job on a day-to-day -day basis and, and the things they love about their job and the things that they hate about their job, which of course is that balanced opinion is, is really important. Our research really can only happen because of our funding. For example, my local environment, the Institute, for rheumatology research has got its own funding body to a certain extent, the Kennedy Trust. Um, and actually through places like the Kennedy Trust website and the Kennedy Institute's website, you'll find out a lot about science and links and career links like that. And of course we get a lot of research money from charities. So things like versus arthritis. So again, feel free. And, and I think it's probably helpful to jump on things like the versus arthritis website to find out more about um, research that's trying to really, help the fight against or versus arthritis. So I, I think it, there's undoubtedly one thing that got me into science and keeps me in science. And that's really just the privilege that one day you might literally see something down the microscope or, or learn from a piece of data, something that no one's ever known before and no one's ever seen before. And that's a pretty magical moment. And, and sometimes if you do it on your own, or it's even better if you do it in a group and you make a discovery, you know, you definitely look around at each other and think this is pretty, this is pretty special times. We're pretty lucky. And then you obviously get very excited about that. That's really what keeps you going. I think it keeps you going because inevitably in science, there are long periods where you learn nothing and you feel like you go backwards. And so sometimes that resilience that you need to build, remembering the good times is very important in science because again, like I probably said previously, if you're doing the right thing. If you're really challenging yourself and asking hard questions, then most of the time it's probably not going to work. And so for a lot of people, that's, that's pretty tough. Now I work within academia. Um, there are different flavors of how academia's career structures are set up because I'm a research or sort of almost entirely research dependent. Um, I'm pretty dependent on our funding streams and that means the job security within research science, whilst I have quite a lot of control over that, obviously at no point probably would I ever be fairly confident of security because our business model, our funding streams really are dependent on the success and um, 
almost the popularity to a certain extent of our of our research within academia there of course there's plenty of very secure routes and, and certainly teaching and doing the mainstream things that academia should be spending a lot of time doing is, is much more secure and then obviously outside of academia and industry there's different flavors again of security you may well be put on a large project that's very exciting very interesting for a good period of time but you're again at the beholdence as many people in the world are of of flavor of the month and of the success of that science so it's well worth taking a bit of time to think about the security of, of, of different professions because unfortunately underlying all of the excitement of the magical moments of science and some of the sort of tough times of resilience where you have to get things working you want to feel like you know where you stand in terms of security so any final tips beyond all of that well i'm very lucky i'm inevitably where i am in large part because people i've met along the way and and mentors that probably either usually informally i've probably gained along the way so people that you can look up to that's very important but people obviously who can be that critical friend who can sort of look at what you're doing and think about the ideas and be a sounding board for those but obviously point out at times where you need to be told is that really the right decision and to sort of you know gently coach you into thinking about what you want and what you want to do next so mentors are very important and there's no question that when a great deal of people stand up at the end of their successful careers in science they look back and they spend most of the time talking about the people they met along the way and the people that inspired them or helped them or maybe directed them or gently pushed them in certain directions along the way and to never avoid or rule out teaching because you really don't know what you're doing and you really don't understand what you're doing as well as you could do until you have to explain it to somebody else and until somebody very bright comes back to you and says i'm sorry but why do you do that you know why did you ask that question why did you do that experiment and so teaching is just fantastic across the board in terms of helping your research be as good as it can be and obviously giving you another string to your bow and i think much like that within academia to not be afraid of, of industry to make sure that you're also if you're in a university sector keeping your eye on industry and if you're in the industry sector, keeping your eye on academia, because people have historically, for some reason, found it very hard often to move between those two arenas. They're thought of as very different places. Um, and I think that's, that's simply not true. And some very successful people have uh, forged very good careers moving between those two areas.